uh, Jeff, welcome uh, and welcome to our audience also. Um, we're delighted you're joining us tonight with um, um, Jeff Kingston, who is uh, director of the Center of Asian Studies at the Temple University of Japan. It's a hotbed actually of interest in policy and policy studies. Uh, and he has a remarkably fine crew of faculty colleagues also. They do exciting public events as well. I've been to several of them and enjoyed them. Uh, so we're very fortunate that Jeff could be with us uh, this evening. Uh, he's written about nationalism and identity in Asia, uh, which is a highly topical subject nowadays, it seems to me with nationalism asserting itself in a number of uh, countries. And uh, we also have uh, here in Japan uh, a very new phenomenon with uh, Prime Minister Abe for health reasons stepping down from uh, the prime ministership in weeks ahead. Uh, and so I think it's a great time for a discussion of uh, the um, uh, Japan and Asia and the geostrategic dimensions of uh, Japan's positioning in Asia, its relations with neighbors, its uh, leadership on issues in Asia, and of course the rest of the world will come into this somewhat too. Uh, so starting out uh, on this, uh, Jeff, um, what caused you to look at nationalism in the context of Asia some time ago? Well, first, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, well, several years ago, uh, I edited a book on nationalism in Asia because I saw uh, how it was, you know, a source of great tension. And the interesting thing that we discovered in that book was that the problem of nationalism is not just between states, but it is also within states. And so the majority population uh, inflicting their nationalism on the minorities in their nation. So if you look at the various countries around Asia, uh, they are diverse societies. Um, many of them have slid away from uh, tolerance and accommodation, uh, just as there's been a sharp democratic recession uh, in the region over the last 10 years. And so I decided to focus on how uh, the politics of religion influence uh, nationalism and identity and uh, covered several countries and the main uh, world religions. Great. Uh, and of course, Japan and its own neighborhood, uh, each uh, country in East Asia has a strong sense of identity. Several of them also have experienced colonialism either directly or indirectly. Uh, and so even in Japan's immediate neighborhood, the issue of sort of internationally expressed nationalism uh, is uh, not a trivial one. Not at all. I mean, the, here we are marking the 75th anniversary of Japan's surrender. And that ended a 15 year war in Asia by Japan uh, in which there was a quite a bit of devastation. Uh, but after 1945 and particularly after 1952 when the American occupation ended, Japan has done so much good for Asia. Uh, so uh, there's really, it was a watershed in Japan's evolving role in Asia. And here at the 21st century, uh, we've seen Japan uh, still stumbling on overcoming those unresolved historical grievances. Uh, and uh, Prime Minister Abe has been at the center of some of those controversies. He has visited President Putin more than almost 30 times 
to try to achieve a peace treaty and to do something about the Northern Territories. Uh, he's also had uh, famous uh, uh, problems with uh, South Korea and the comfort women issue. And Japan has also uh, stumbled, I think, on achieving some of the Millennium Development Goals in Asia. For example, on the environment, Japan is the leading financier of coal-powered plants. And it has really done much for women's discrimination. And one of the things I was surprised about is that the Japanese ambassador to Myanmar was actually defending the expulsion of the Rohingya and was supporting Aung San Suu Kyi's efforts to achieve vindication in International Court of Justice. So these have been exciting times. Now with the resignation of Prime Minister Abe, uh, one wonders uh, if his successor, most likely Chief Cabinet Spokesman Suga, is going to make the same commitment to resolving issues with Russia, to the abduction issue with North Korea, and the historical grievances with South Korea, and whether the brief thaw in relations with China has created an opening. So we are in interesting times, many challenges and opportunities ahead. Great, well, let's roam beyond the immediate neighborhood and think of wider Asia involving also uh, a couple of actors in the Pacific, uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I read in today's newspapers that the United States is advocating a sort of formalization of the Quad, the so-called Quad, which is a grouping uh, that um, uh, it, includes uh, in Washington's conception, particularly uh, Australia, India, uh, Japan, and the United States, and is seen as uh, both an interlocutor with China, but also a buffer against uh, China's uh, rise, so to speak. Yeah, I see this as pretty much a containment policy. And it's, you know, the earlier version in Abe 1, when he was Prime Minister 2006 and 7, was the arc of freedom and prosperity based on shared democratic values, commitment to human rights. Uh, that never got off the ground, never got any traction, but it's been revived in Abe 2 as a free and open Indo-Pacific. And this is also a concept based on shared values. And the Quad is sort of the security aspect of that, where they have joint military exercises. And I think this is meant to dissuade China from its expansionist agenda. Um, the free and open Indo-Pacific is supposed to be a concert of democracies. And I think uh, this, in a way, helps to make it more palatable to the Japanese public, which obviously has some pacifist reservations about uh, Abe's posturing on security. Great. Now, the Indians also, for a long time, had reservations about formalizing a quad. For one thing, they had not always easy relations with Australia, in spite of sending, or perhaps because they were sending so many Indian students, or Indian parents were sending so many Indian students to Australia. Uh, and, so, and also because China has been a very important economic partner for India. But since some clashes in, on the Himalayan border of uh, between China and India. Um, uh, India, which was initially reluctant even to discuss the first clash, has become more assertive in response to it. And there has now, in very recent days, been a second clash uh, on the border. The first one having killed 20 Indian soldiers which without the use of firearms is quite an achievement. Yeah, I think as you pointed out, the India is warming up to the concept, but I'm not sure they're fully committed uh, just yet. Um, I think that uh, there are ominous developments in the region, uh, tensions have ratcheted up, uh, but I, I'm, I'm not very sure that uh, the Quad is going anytime soon to be anything like a NATO. Mm. 
Now, one of uh, Abe's great successes, I think he will be remembered for, is after the United States, or specifically President Trump, uh, defected from the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, by then consensus, uh, um, Mr. Abe reflected for quite a bit of time, may have been privately lining up his ducks, and then made a move to salvage what was left of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, rebranding it slightly, which was a risky thing to do in the sense that Trump might have reacted very badly to that. He doesn't seem to have known what to make of it and didn't react badly to it. Just as Mr. Abe also reached out to Iran, which is something the United States might have reacted badly towards. So uh, on the international level, in some ways, he's been a risk taker. Yes, definitely. I think his biggest uh, diplomatic achievement is being an advocate for free trade. So rescuing the TPP when Trump pulled the plug, uh, sealing a, a comprehensive deal with the European Union, certainly he has stepped up. He has been a risk taker. He's certainly the most active uh, Japanese prime minister, probably has met more world leaders uh, than the last five prime ministers combined. So that assertive uh, presence on the international stage, uh, I think will be missed. I think he did put Japan back in the game. It's really hard to imagine that his designated successor, Chief Cabinet Spokesperson Suga, is going to be able to fill those big shoes. So I think um, it'll be interesting to see in what ways his foreign policy achievements are sustained and whether there will be a continued advocacy for free trade, uh, given that the pandemic has created a lot of pressures on various countries' economies. Ter uh, terrific. Well, I think we're uh, about to open up to questions from the audience. I wanted to ask you if there's anything you'd like to add before we do. No, I, I think it's so hard to uh, let the audience uh, jump in here. I'd like to hear uh, what their questions are. Great. So, Sandeep, over to you to tell us. Thank you very much. Um, our first question comes from Marco Schumann here in Tokyo. His question is, when you look at Europe, it tries to find a way how to deal with China. There seems to be no clear direction yet and no unified EU stance how to manage that relationship with China appropriately, however. Japan is a value partner for Europe. What, in your opinion, can Europe learn from Japan with regard to how it deals with China? Well, you know, there's been a thaw in Sino-Japanese relations, but, you know, there's still a long way to go. I think that uh, the big difference is that the shared history of Japan and China has been uh, very fraught and creates a, a number of different challenges that Europe doesn't have. So I think Europe's connection with China is, you know, essentially more economic, where I think in, you know, Japan and China are neighbors and uh, they have a lot of different ways or different areas where they interact. The way that I guess that they could uh, learn from Japan is uh, Japan has been firm and Japan has stood up for its rights. And so we saw recently uh, the, uh, the Czech government sent a senator to Taiwan and you know, sort of a riffing off of uh, John F. Kennedy. I'm a Berliner. He says, I'm Taiwanese. So I think that you're seeing in Europe, um, there is a movement towards uh, trying to stand up more to China and not just accept uh, China's, uh, you know, dominance uh, in the world economy. Great. Excellent. Um, our next question is from Takehito Kamata. Um, He's a project postdoctoral fellow at Sofia University. He asked, how can we educate the next generation of leaders in Asian diplomacy? And what is the role of Japan to promote academic engagement across Asian nations without international travels as well right now, given COVID? Yeah, that is one of the big challenges in the pandemic is it's 
impossible to do field work. Uh, for me, field work is essential. Go interview people, get some dirt under the fingernails. Um, how to educate the next generation uh, in terms of Asian diplomacy. Um, I think you know a number of uh, good programs in Japan are trying to do that. And I think that um, we need to build on those programs. But I think essentially those programs are already in place. But what can Japan do to nurture leaders around the world? Uh, they used to have an interesting program at the International House in Japan uh, in which they brought over leaders from civil society from various Asian nations and let them spend uh, several months here in Japan, essentially, you know, to do whatever was of interest to them. And that program tragically ended a few years ago because of lack of funding. And I think that that was a great opportunity missed. I, I would like to see more of that type of engagement, not just government leaders, but also at the level of civil society, also at the level of the media. And I think uh, Japan has a lot to contribute in that area, uh, is probably punching a bit below its weight. Great. Um, our next question is from Shotemur. He's a student of the University of World Economy and Diplomacy. He has a more broad question. He's asking, what do you think about the rising influence of China in Central Asia? Well, um, you know, the, the Chinese, uh, you know, efforts to build a, the one, well, one Belt, One Road, um, I think they are, you know, investing heavily there. I think you see many of these weak, impoverished states um, are enthralled to Beijing and, um, you know, I think that this has traditionally been an area of Russian uh, influence. And so there has been a bit of a changing of the guard, but you know, it's been a few years since I've been to Central Asia. The last I was in Kyrgyzstan, um, the Chinese presence uh, wasn't that noticeable. And that was uh, maybe eight or nine years ago. So I think things have changed a lot since I've been there, but uh, I'm probably not as familiar as the, uh, the gentleman that is about that situation. Excellent. Um, the next question is from Colin Peros, a master student at the University of Tokyo. He says, uh, you mentioned the strengths of Prime Minister Abe. What are some areas of opportunity for Japan to excel with the new Prime Minister? Well, I'm pretty pessimistic. Um, you know, basically the fix is in. Suga's the next prime minister and, you know, he's a caretaker. I mean, the problem for Suga is he's so closely associated with Abe and his policies. And in my view, Japan needs for more creative thinking about pandemic economic countermeasures. So I think that Abenomics has been basically, if you look at all the political obituaries, is seen to be a flop. Uh, and so I think what needs to happen is Japan needs to think, how can we revive consumption in Japan? Japan needs the global economy to recover, to build a sustainable recovery here, but what can Japan do for itself? In my view, uh, perhaps they could uh, put in place temporary uh, guaranteed income, uh, more job subsidies, more training, things along those lines. So I think that you know there are different types of approaches that have not yet been explored. And the problem is, you know, Suga, you know, he's a nose to the grindstone sort of throwback to the salary man stereotype. How is he going to be a model for changing work-life balance in Japan? And, you know, he brags he never takes a day off. So I'm not sure he is the right leader for this time. I think Japan needs a resolute leader taking urgent action. And I just I have a nagging suspicion that that is probably not going to happen. Um, our next question is from Garen, um, Garen Molloy from Daito Bunka University. Um, this is actually another post Abe question. I think those will be popular today. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, what prospects can you see for Japanese cooperation with Korea post Abe, particularly in regional security issues, but also in broader issues? Korea, you mean South Korea or North Korea or both? Uh, North Korea. Korea, Abe has been so closely associated with the abduction issue. And so there was never going to be direct talks between Pyongyang and Tokyo as long as Abe was in power. So there is possibly a chance to hit the reset button there and 
maybe they could have a direct dialogue. I think that is not highly likely, but possible. In terms of South Korea, I think um, the consensus in Japan is that um, there's very little reason to make any concession to South Korea over the historical grievances that divide the two countries. And you can argue about, you know, the 2015 Comfort Women Agreement or the Supreme Court decision regarding forced labor. But clearly, I think uh, the ruling conservative elite here is fed up. They think the ball is in South Korea's court. So I think um, the Moon administration uh, might consider some more proactive diplomacy to try to um, open up some sort of more positive dialogue. If ever there was a dire need to hit the reset button on a bilateral relationship, certainly it's the case between Seoul and Tokyo. But again, I'm not particularly optimistic on that score. I see. And our next question is from Adlina Arshad, a business analyst in Malaysia. She asks, um, with PM Abe stepping down and Japan's economy not in the best of times, obviously, given COVID as well, um, what, in your opinion, in which area can Japan contribute and reposition itself as a model for Asia, actually? That's a very tough question. Uh, yes, Abe leaves office with the Japanese economy smaller than when he came in. Uh, Abenomics hasn't really worked so well. Uh, I think that Japan has embraced a values-oriented diplomacy as represented in the free and open Indo-Pacific, but has really sort of averted its eyes from the democratic recession and from human rights violations. So whether it's Hong Kong, Tibet, uh, the Uyghurs, uh, the Rohingya, Kashmir, Islamophobia under Modi in India, I think on all these issues, Japan could speak out a little bit more loudly, but instead uh, is averted its eyes and sort of undermines its position as being an advocate for a values-oriented diplomacy. I think what Japan can do is show other countries through uh, its investments, sort of trade, uh, through technology, uh, to help these countries develop and to make its markets open to products exported from these countries. That I think can help a lot more. Other than that, it's really hard to see in which way Japan can be a hugely positive role model. We have actually another question on the South Korean cooperation. Um, this one relates to who do you think, is there anybody in sight in Japan or in Korea, who do you think could change the narrative of Korean Japanese relations in the near future? There must be, but I'm not sure I can identify who they are. Um, I think it's in the interest of both countries to overcome their differences. Uh, but I think that, you know, the uh, Japanese colonial uh, experience is embedded in the national identity of Koreans. So it's very hard to overcome that. And some, you know, Japanese uh, have tried to make amends. For example, back in 2011, Prime Minister Naoto Kan uh, made a very poignant, powerful speech on the centenary of, you know, Japanese colonial rule. And it was very well received among Koreans. NHK that same evening went around interviewing various politicians and came to Abe and his one word reaction was baka. So uh, the problem is I think some Japanese have seized the nettle of history and do want to move forward. I think that um, the problem is that too often uh, their comments and positions are disavowed by others, and so Japan sends a mixed message. The thing, too, is takes two to tango. So it's not just up to Japan, the perpetrator, but also the victims also have to decide that they want to get over their shared past. And I'm not sure that, that uh, they've achieved that yet in South Korea. Thank you. By the way, that question was from Sven Saller from Sofia University. Forgot to mention his name. Um, the next question is from Emi Kameta at the Embassy of Mexico in Japan. She asks, now that Shinzo Abe's term has ended, how would you evaluate the results of Abenomics overall, actually? Well, 
know, he came in and made a lot of promises about Abenomics, but essentially I view it as a flop. Uh, the economy hasn't grown, it wasn't sustainable. Uh, the job growth was mostly in non-regular employment. Womenomics was a sham. There hasn't been actually uh, much progress at all in gender equality. In fact, uh, this past year, Japan uh, dropped 10 slots in the World Economic Forum uh, gender equality rankings to 121 in the world out of 153 nations. So there isn't a lot there to be proud of. And what's happened is Japan has left behind a mountain of debt. Uh, the highest uh, public debt to GDP ratio in the world. So I think that uh, the legacy of Abenomics will be with Japan for quite some time. The real problem of Abenomics is that the third era promised sweeping structural reforms. That just didn't happen. And I think Japan has dropped the ball on immigration, and this is a way that they could perhaps uh, be helpful uh, to the rest of Asia by accepting more migrants. Uh, but you know, Abe, you know, very clearly uh, stated that we do not have an immigration policy, only a migration policy, limited number of workers for a fixed duration of time. And the amount that they're contemplating, 345,000 over five years, is a drop in the bucket for a labor market of over 60 million people. And the problem is that the conditions uh, for these visas were not all that appealing. So Japan has really had trouble attracting very many applicants uh, for this new visa program. And so there is, a, I think, uh, an opportunity for Japan to rethink immigration and how it might help alleviate some of their uh, urgent uh, demographic challenges. Thank you. I think this will be the last question. We have so many, but there's only so much time. Um, the next question is from Tiago Mauricio from the Embassy of Portugal in Japan. I think we can end hopefully on a, hope, on a hopeful note, a positive note here. Um, he asks, um, multiculturalism is currently being eroded by different threats around the world internal conflicts, humanitarian crises, climate change, socioeconomic inequality, there's so many to mention. But what are possible pathways for Japan to contribute effectively and productively to multilateralism, either regionally or globally, or even through the United Nations? Well, I think that um, one way would be to uh, work more closely with the UNHCR and to help uh, resettle more refugees, uh, each year, only a handful are accepted. I think Japan could do a lot more on that front. I think Japan is very active in Asian regional organizations, uh, whether it's ASEAN, the ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, the Asian Development Bank. And I think there's a lot of room for cooperation between Japan and China on infrastructure projects. I mean, anybody who has you know, traveled much around Asia realizes that upgrading the infrastructure is something everywhere needs. And I think that uh, the combination of China and Japan working on these uh, challenges that all of Asia faces, I think, could be a, a positive development. And there's obviously, you know, with the pandemic, uh, we see that there are sort of non-traditional threats to security. And I think this is another area where Japan can cooperate more uh, with its regional neighbors. So I hope that was somewhat positive. I think it was. Great. Uh, well, Jeff, thank you so much. This was really a vigorous engagement. I thought it would be with you. Uh, we're very grateful to you. Uh, Temple University really is, thanks to uh, uh, its denizens like Chef, uh, is a tremendously dynamic place intellectually. And it incarnates critical thinking, which I always think is the highest value of ac the academic world. The ability to question uh, received wisdom. And it's not a great strength in Asia. So Asia benefits even more from the presence of institutions like Temple University, constantly asking uncomfortable questions that uh, do not lend themselves to polite answers, rather force one to rethink 
the polite positions one has adopted. And so I think that's a major contribution to the Tokyo scene and the wider Asian scene, Jeff, and we're very deeply grateful to you. Well, thank you very much. We do our best to battle the forces of darkness, and I really appreciate this opportunity to have a conversation with you and to engage in such a large audience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.